hey guys and thanks for joining so today's case is actually ongoing and uh, if you live in the uk or you know you are following from the uk then you probably seen it all over the news and uh, the and the alleged people responsible they are detained and they are on trial and like i said the trial is ongoing so everything that i'm saying in this video is alleged and uh, it's all the information that i have from all the news articles and also the media who is covering the trial so uh, there might be more developments happening because the trial is monday to friday and we don't know when it's going to end so yeah for now i'm just going to give you whatever there is available out there okay so constance martin a 37 year old woman from a wealthy background has been at the center of a captivating and tragic news story in the UK since early 2023. So this is fairly recent. And when I say wealthy, I mean it like wealthy, wealthy, as in connections with the royal family, the parliament, the late queen in high up circles, all of that and even more. And it all began in early January 2023 when Constance, heavily pregnant, vanished alongside her partner, 49-year-old Mark Gordon. Their Peugeot car was found burnt out near the M61 motorway in Bolton, Greater Manchester. Crucial evidence suggested that Constance had recently given birth. Their disappearance coincided with the birth of their daughter. A concerned driver, Kenneth Hudson, remembered picking up the couple and their newborn baby. However, they were soon dropped off at the service station. When the couple were arrested, they were not with their baby, triggering a police search involving over 200 officers across an area of around 90 square miles or 230 square kilometers, extending from Brighton to New Haven. So... Let's see what we know so far and I'm hoping that it's not going to be confusing because there will be a lot of names uh, here and I'll try to make it, you know, as straightforward as possible. So from January to February 2023, a large scale search involving the Metropolitan Police and National Crime Agency took place. Constance and Mark traveled by taxi across various locations, including Liverpool, Harwich, London, and finally Brighton. Public appeals were made, highlighting the potential risk to the newborn's welfare in the cold winter weather. Sadly, however, on 1st of March, the lifeless body of the couple's baby, called Victoria, was found in a little plastic bag within a Brighton allotment shed. The remains were badly decomposed. Constance and Mark were arrested very soon after in the nearby Stanmore Park. Constance and Mark are currently on trial at the Old Bailey Court in London. They both pled not guilty to manslaughter charges related to Victoria's death. The trial has revealed a complex story. And it really is. Constance claims that the baby's death was a horrible accident which happened while they were camping rough on the South Downs, so they were essentially homeless. Constance admitted placing Victoria's body in a bag, but she insists that it wasn't her intention to abandon her baby's remains. But the prosecution in the case argues differently, questioning their actions during the crucial weeks they were on the run and the state in which Victoria's body was found. The exact cause of Victoria's death still remains unclear. The couple's motives for disappearing and their actions during that time are also under scrutiny by the court. Constant Martin's story is a tangled web filled with privilege, secrecy and most of all a tragic loss. And before we move on, let's just start with the word for today in Romanian which is gravida. Gra -vi the gravida well done guys you just said pregnant so in order for us to understand everything we kind of need to go back to constance martin her childhood her family their connections and also mark 
Marx's childhood and, uh, you know, so we are going to go through their history. Constance Martin was born into an aristocratic family in 1987 and she had a private education at St. Mary's Independent School. She was educated at this well-respected boarding school which would cost th more than £30,000 a year. She then went on to study Arabic and Middle Eastern studies at the University of Leeds in 2008. So after she graduated in 2012, Constance became a researcher at the London office of Al Jazeera before becoming a freelance photographer. By 2014, Constance, she tried out acting, enrolling in a drama course at East 15 Drama School in Essex. Classmate on the course would describe Constance to the Sunday Times as just beautiful, full of life, full of kindness, and she was very, very talented. But in 2016, Constance, she suddenly dropped out of the course. According to her classmates, she had changed and she was in an erratic relationship with a man that they never met. That man was Mark Gordon. After Constance dropped out of the drama course, she, you know, she kind of went off grid in, and it was very hard to hear anything from her. She also stopped posting on social media and she became estranged from her family. Her and Mark allegedly lived together in Ilford up until 2020. According to neighbors, there was often shouting coming from the flat and very soon Constance and Mark got evicted because of causing extensive damage to the flat that they rented. Apparently, Constance had met Mark in a London incense shop around 2014 and they quickly became friends while she attended the East 15 acting school as a student. And in 2016, while traveling in Peru, Constance and Mark got married in a ceremony which is not recognized in the UK. So it seems that Constance, she kind of had a bright future ahead of her until she met Mark. Mark Gordon, who is 13 years older than Constance, was born in Birmingham in 1974 but he relocated to Florida, US with his mother when he was just a child. In 1989, at the age of 14, it was alleged that he broke into a neighbor's property and raped her at, at knife point. He was found guilty of one count of armed kidnapping, four separate counts of armed sexual battery and one count of burglary with a deadly weapon. He served 20 years of his 40-year sentence in prison, but then he was deported back to the UK in 2010, still proclaiming his innocence. Public records reveal that he had a 2008 conviction for sex offenses involving a child under 13 years old. Constance's father, Napier Martin, and her mother, Virginie de Selier, had three sons, including her younger brother, Tobias. Constance, she grew up in Creechel House in Dorset, but she became estranged from her family around 2012. Both her parents, they actually had a wealthy heritage with her father having close ties to the royal family. Constance's grandmother was a playmate of Princess Margaret, whilst her father served as a page to Queen Elizabeth II. Her grandmother received an OBE in 1980 and she was later named High Sheriff of Dorset. Now, an OBE means an officer of the Order of the British Empire. This is awarded for having a major local role in any activity, including people whose work has made them known nationally in their chosen area. So, Constance's grandfather was of an equal stature, serving as a lieutenant commander in the Royal Navy. The couple, they had six children, including Napier, Constance's father, who inherited the family's 115 million pounds fortune. Constance and her siblings, Maximilian and Toby, were raised in Creature House, a home befitting their aristocratic heritage in Dorset. Now, this property sits on 5,000 acres of land and was described as one of the most magnificent Georgian mansions in England 
as well as being the setting of the 1996 adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma, starring Ewan McGregor and Gwyneth Paltrow. Constance's father, Napier Martin, was born on March 28, 1959, as the only son of George and Mary Martin. He has five sisters and was educated at Eton. Eton is another prestigious college and it costs around £40,000 per year to study there. Uh, now, just to get an idea of how prestigious this is, Prince William and Prince Harry, they both studied there along with other princes, princesses, lords, dukes, earls and high ups. Napier, Constance's father, served as the late Queen's page, who was essentially someone who served the Queen, attended to her at all times, and as far as I understand, during official ceremonies, he would be one of the member of staff to hold the dress train of the Queen, some kind of royal objects which were part of ceremonies, and, you know, basically this is kind of the long story short of an explanation for a page. Napier was also the heir to Critchell Estate, in which him and his family lived in Dorset and the family's 115 million pounds fortune. But he gave up this fortune for a life in Australia. It seems that at some point he had an epiphany, he shaved his head and he was kind of living out of his van with the family in Australia. He then married Virginie Camus in 1986 and they had Constance one year later. He left his family when Constance was around nine years old. Napier and Virginie are now divorced. Now we need to see who Virginie is because she's also very important. Virginie de Salier or Virginie Charlotte Camus was born on September 14, 1959 and she married Napier in 1986. So Virginie is Constance's mother, Napier is Constance's father. Virginie works as a psychotherapist specializing in trauma, family therapy and grief with private practices in Shavesbury and Notting Hill. Virginie, she married after divorcing Napier, Guy de Salier de Moranville in 1998 and he is also another big figure. He was a senior advisor to the Atlantic Council's Future Europe Initiative and now he serves as the president and co-founder of HCF International Advisors, which is a finance advisory firm focused on the mining and metals industry. He also worked as an advisor to the European Commission, also a co-chairman with the Russian Deputy Minister of Energy, he was also at one point senior vice president for Lehman Brothers and the project officer with the World Bank responsible for metals and mining projects. One of Constance's younger brother, Maximilian Martin, he married the jewelry designer Ruth Amor in August 2021 at York House in Richmond. So Constance's brother, he works in sustainable real estate. Now his wife's jewelry pieces have been featured in the likes of Harper's Bazaar and Vogue Italia. Mary Anna Martin, Constance's grandmother, she was the goddaughter of the late Queen Mother and the trustee of the British Museum. She was born on September the 12th, 1929 and she joined the Buckingham Palace Brownies Unit alongside Princess Margaret. I think that this uh, Brownies Unit is kind of like Girl Scouts, something like that. Upon the death of her father, Baron Ellington, in active service in the RAF in 1940, Mary Anna inherited the Critchell House estate in Dorset. She made legal history in the Critchell Down affair, which saw her regain her family's home after it was forcefully purchased by the government in 1938 for bomb training. George Goslin Martin, Constance's grandfather, was a lieutenant commander in the Royal Navy with further close links to the royals. He was born on December 28, 1918 and he was an equerry to George VI. 
Now, an equerry is essentially an officer of the British royal household who attends or assists members of the royal family. George had married the Mary in November 1949, and the wedding was actually attended by George VI, the Queen Mother, and also by Princess Margaret. Constance's father, Napier, was their fourth child and the only son born in 1959. Their second daughter, Charlotte, she married Oswald Alexander Mosley in 1975. Oswald was the son of politician Oswald Mosley and Diana Mitford and brother of former Formula One president Max Mosley. So, yeah, maybe it's kind of like confusing and, you know, everything, but you can see clearly all of the connections here within the family, right? Constance Martin, she became a beneficiary of her grandmother's will and she was being paid monthly by the Sturt Family Trust Fund through the private bank horse into her Metro bank account. It seems that the funds to her were paid rarely into the bank account until she had to remind the trustees that they had a duty of care towards her and they had to maintain her in a similar manner to her siblings. Constance claimed that the trust failed to provide her with a home. From beginning of September 2022, Constance was receiving monthly payments from the family trust, initially for £2,500 a month, but then went up to £3,400 a month in December 2022. She also received £3,800, which she said was for the cost of storing her belongings. On 13th of November, almost £14,000 was paid into her bank account for camera and filming equipment after she said that she wanted to start working again. On 22nd of December, almost £16,000 was transferred to her account after she said that she wanted to buy a new car. In total, from the beginning of September 2022, to mid January 2023, almost £50,000 was paid into her account by Horse Bank. Two big withdrawals of 4000 and 2000 were made on 31st of December 2022 and 5th of January 2023. On 5th of January, which was also the day that the car Constance Martin and Mark Gordon were using caught fire, there was almost £20,000 in her bank account. So over the next few weeks, while police were looking for Constance and Mark, there were no withdrawals until 27th of February 2023, the night that they were both arrested. The prosecution says that during that time they were living in a tent on the South Downs with their newborn baby, Victoria. There are also suggestions that there was growing tension between Constance and her family in the years leading up to her disappearance. Newspapers reported that her decision to distance herself from some family members may have been because of their disapproval around her relationship with Mark. Her and Mark, they have four children together, with Victoria being the fifth. The four surviving children were removed from their care by social services. The children were removed when a judge found that there was an incident of domestic violence. On another occasion, police was called when the couple went to a hospital to have their first baby in 2017 where they gave false names. Constance, she first went to a hospital in London in June 2017 where she told the hospital that she had been living in a camper van. Social services then issued a national hospital alert to other parts of the NHS, which is issued when it's suspected that a pregnant woman needs protection or support. Constance then attended the hospital in Wales with Mark that same winter where she was in the early stages of labor and she was admitted as an unbooked case meaning that the mother had no NHS prenatal care. She said that her name was Isabella O'Brien, while Mark said that his name was James Amor. Telling staff that she was from a traveling family, she never went to school and she doesn't have an NHS number.
When their real identities were discovered, police was actually called as well as social services. Constance told them that they moved to Wales to get away from her family. It was then found that they had been living in a tent in a wooded area and they only bought some clothing and nappies in preparation for the arrival of their first child. Constance took a social worker to their tent, probably to, you know, show her the living situation. This tent was described by the social worker as a festival style tent, not suitable for cold weather. It was bowed under rainwater and smelled stale. There were a number of black bean bags containing clothing. The social worker explained to Constance the, that it was winter and the crowded space wasn't an appropriate space for living. Constance defended their living conditions, saying that she and Mark ha had an alternative lifestyle and asked them not to judge her. The baby born in Wales in winter 2017, known only as baby FF, was initially made the subject of an interim care order and Constance lived with the baby in temporary mother and baby accommodation. Two times, social workers spoke to her about the risk of falling asleep with the baby on her chest. It was explained that falling asleep with a baby on you poses significant risk due to the potential of suffocation, overheating and positional asphyxia. Also, the weight of an adult's body combined with the soft surface of a bed or a couch can cause the baby's head to be positioned in a way which restricts their ability to breathe properly, which of course can be extremely dangerous. Constance, she then promised not to do this, saying that she will look after the baby and she will keep the baby safe. Then an order was made which allowed for FF to be cared for by Constance and Mark under, so, under social services supervision. This order was discharged in 2018. After that, they moved away from Wales and they had three more children. But after the birth of their second child, referred to as GG, social services became involved again. During one home visit, when Constance was heavily pregnant, she hid her body behind the door and she said that she didn't want social services to be draconian. At one point, the couple actually left the child behind in hospital so they could attend a family court hearing, even though they had been offered a video link. But side note, and I'm not sure if this happens in all of the cases, but I think that when you are offered uh, a family court hearing in court or via video link, uh, I think that uh, usually your solicitor advises you to attend court because it kind of looks much better, um, you know, for the judge, for you in front of the judge, rather than being in a video link. Once they had been separated from their children, they continued having contact sessions at which their interaction with the children was described as excellent. But their attendance at the contact sessions was inconsistent and the children were upset by this. One child actually became quiet, withdrawn and inconsolable, saying on one occasion, mommy and daddy cancelled again. After assessing the evidence, a family court judge ordered, ordered that the four children should be adopted and care placement orders were made for all four of the children. However, Constance would later say that she had to go up against influential family members with connections in high places as she fought for her children. In court, she said that she was not a disgruntled, disgruntled parent but she disagreed with the findings in her children's case. She also said, quote, The problem I had was I was not just up against social services, but family members were very influential with huge connections in high places, including parliament. If they said to social services jump, social services will say how high. They were highly embarrassed about the fact I had children with Mark, and the fact that they do not come from an upper-class privileged background." End quote. She also mentioned that the unnamed family members would go to any length to get what they wanted. She said that the reason she lied whilst in hospital was because she knew that her family will stop at nothing because they disagreed with her choices. She added, quote, I would be prepared to lie to save my children. 
I would throw myself in front of a bus to save my children. I would do whatever I have to do to save my children. End of quote. And honestly, I kind of believe that in the sense that her family is very well connected. They could have very well been involved, allegedly, in the removal of the children. But anyway, when I would be very curious to know to whom the children went, but I don't think that there is any public record of this. But anyway, when her and Mark were on the run, her parents made public statements urging her to make herself known to the police. In an open letter shared with the press, her mother Virginie wrote, quote, You have made choices in your personal adult life which have proven to be challenging. However, I respect them. I know that you want to keep your precious newborn child at all costs. With all that you have gone through, this baby cannot be removed from you, but instead needs looking after in a kind and warm environment. I want to help you and my grandchild. You deserve the opportunity to build a new life, establish a stable family, and enjoy the same freedoms that most of us have. I will do what I can to stand alongside you and my grandchild. You are not alone in this situation. We will support you in whatever way we can, end quote. I mean, okay, I get it that this is like, you know, an open letter or a statement to the press or whatever, but doesn't this letter seem to you like a really cold one coming from a mother to her daughter? Like, you know, it's very professionally written and not something that you would say to your child to get them back home. I mean, I don't know, but to me it seems like very, very cold and detached. It seems almost like an arranged, prepared public statement, not even written by a parent. Constance's father, Napier, also said when speaking to the Independent, Darling Constance, even though we remain estranged at the moment, I stand by as I have always done and as the family has always done to do whatever is necessary for your safe return to us. The past eight years have been beyond painful for all the family as well as your friends as they must have been for you. And to see you so vulnerable again is testing in the extreme. Please, Constance, find the courage to present yourself to the police as soon as possible. We will support you in whatever way we can. I beseech you to find a way to turn yourself and your wee one into the police as soon as possible so you and he or she can be protected. Only then can a process of healing and recovery begin. However long it may take, however difficult it may be, end of quote. So I'm going to repeat, this is from her father. The previous one was from her mother. And again, this kind of seems to me like very, very cold, the father as well. And even, you know, before talking about how beyond painful he was for the last eight years and so on, he first mentions the family, how painful he was for the family and then her friends. And then only at the end about her. Again, I don't really see any kind of compassion or any kind of love shown in their words as if they are giving speeches to someone or to the crowd or the cameras or whatever. I don't know. So anyway, we all became aware of Constance's disappearance in early January 2023. She was heavily pregnant and she was involved with Mark Gordon. Because of her pregnancy and Mark's criminal record, there were immediate concerns, obviously also because of social services' previous involvement. In the meantime, baby Victoria was born. During the search for them, starting from 5th of January onwards, their abandoned car, the Peugeot 206, was found on fire near the M61 motorway in Bolton, Greater Manchester. This discovery raised concerns for Constance's well-being and the health of her newborn baby. Evidence was discovered that Constance had given birth several days before. So it was January the 6th, 2023, when a grim discovery was made near the burnt-out car. A placenta was found in the wreckage, further solidifying the belief that Constance had recently given birth. This added urgency to the search as the newborn's health and safety became paramount concerns in the cold winter weather. After abandoning their car, the couple asked a passing motorist, Kenneth Hudson, to take them and their baby to the, to the nearest services. They then traveled by taxis to Liverpool, then Harwich in Essex, then London, and finally to Brighton, 
on 8th of January. More than 100 officers of the Metropolitan Police were involved in the initial search, assisted by the National Crime Agency. The Greater Manchester Police issued public appeals through various channels, including media broadcasts and social media posts. Photos of Constance and Mark were circulated along with descriptions of the newborn baby. The appeals emphasized the potential risk to the newborn's health if they were not receiving proper medical care and also because of the harsh winter weather. Then the situation started looking a bit more hopeful when Kenneth Hassan, the driver, came forward. He recognized the photos and remembered picking up the couple and their newborn baby on the M61, describing them as vulnerable and cold. He dropped them off at the service station shortly after. Investigators then meticulously traced the couple's movements through CCTV footage, credit card transactions and witness reports. The search stretched across various locations, Liverpool, Harwich, London and then finally Brighton. And the search proved actually quite challenging. The trail of Constance and Mark remained cold, but investigators managed to piece together a possible route based on whatever little evidence that they had. The CCTV footage and credit card transactions suggested movement across various locations, which included, like I already mentioned, Liverpool, Harwich and London. While authorities were searching for them, Constance and Mark stayed under the radar. Evidence suggests that they were living a transient life, relying on cash withdrawals and disposable burner phones to avoid being found. The exact locations are unclear, but witness testimonies point towards sightings on the outskirts of major cities and rural areas. The high-profile nature of the case attracted significant media attention. News outlets across the country provided regular updates on the search, keeping the public informed and engaged. By late February, the search efforts shifted focus. New leads, possibly from CCTV footage or, you know, witness reports, directed investigators towards Brighton on the south coast of England and the intensified search efforts finally led to a crucial breakthrough. On February 27th, a significant development happened. Constance and Mark were arrested in Stanmer Park, a large public park on the outskirts of Brighton. The circumstances surrounding the arrests remain unclear, but this was a turning point in the case. But the most obvious question, like the elephant in the room, where was baby Victoria? Well, I need to speak to you. Well, because potentially I think you may have been in national news. Right, you can't wait for me. So, put, the, put the stick down. Drop it now. 
Who right, at this moment in time, until I can confirm who you are, you're both under arrest on suspicion of child neglect. You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence. If you don't mention when questioned, something which is not in court, anything to be given in. Do you have understand? What's your name? Arabella. Where's your child, my friend? Where's the child? Where's my food, please? In a minute, where's your child? Oh, where's the child, madam? Where is the child, please? Daddy bear. Look at me. Constance. Yeah, Constance, Arabella, you are. Right, right, where's your child? Have we searched her? Soon you tell us. This isn't at the front, is it? I've just asked. I'm going to undo it now. Yes. I've just... I'll level with you. You're under arrest for child neglect. Well, Section 27, Offence Against the Person Act. Expose a child under the age of two years, whereas life or health is to be endangered. Do you understand? Understand what I've said to you. Do you understand what I've said to you? You've been further arrested for three more offences. You are under arrest for concealment of the birth of a child. How's that? That's not arrest. Just, just right. And that's section not 20, offence. section 27, Offences Against the Person Act, expose a child under the age of two years, whereas by life or health to be endangered. Do you understand what you've been arrested for? Right. Right. Okay, well that's, well that's not an there, yeah. okay, there are the offences that I've arrested you on suspicion of. The necessity for your arrest is to protect from the person and prevent disappearance. Do you understand that you've been arrested? After the couple were found without their baby, an extensive search encompassing around 90 square miles of land from Brighton to New Haven involving over 200 officers helicopters, sniffer dogs, drones, and thermal cameras took place. Constance and Mark would refuse to say where their missing baby was. 48 hours after the search began, a uh, baby's remains were found wrapped in a plastic bag and hidden inside the shed on an allotment. On 1st of March, it was confirmed that the baby was baby Victoria. She was found sadly deceased. It's believed that she died a few weeks earlier on the 9th of January, but the remains were so badly decomposed that the cause of death could not be determined. On 2nd of March at 6 p.m. a candlelight vigil was held for Victoria at St. Mary Magdalene's Church in Colding, Brighton. A memorial was made on the corner between Stanmore Villas and Golf Drive near to where the baby was found. On 3rd of March, Constance and Mark appeared before Crowley Magistrates Court charged with gross negligence manslaughter, concealing the birth of a child, child cruelty, and perverting the course of justice. During the court appearance, the baby's name was revealed but was then referred to only as Baby A. The couple were remanded in custody pending further pending their further appearance at central london's old bailey on 31st of march 2023 constance and mark appeared in the old bailey dock in early january 2024 so just uh, like what two months ago they denied all charges relating to the death of baby a contained within the charges presented to the court by the prosecution the judge, Mark Lucraft, King's Counsel, ordered the selection and swearing-in of the jury and the trial started on 26th of January 2024. It was reported, the Telegraph reported that the couple are accused of concealing the birth of a child, cruelty to a person under 16, causing or allowing the death of a child and perverting the course of justice. The ongoing trial at the Old Bailey in London actually shed some light on the complexities of the case. Constance maintained that Victoria's death was a tragic accident which happened while they were rough sleeping in the South Downs. She admits placing Victoria's body in a bag but says that it wasn't her intention to abandon her. The prosecution, however, paints a different picture. They scrutinized the couple's actions during their disappearance, highlighting the harsh weather conditions and the state in which Victoria's body was found. Witness testimonies and expert opinions are being presented, trying to piece together the timeline of events. 
the couple's motives for disappearing and their choices during that time are also under intense scrutiny. The defense portrays them as a young couple unprepared for parenthood and fearful of social media, of social services involvement because of Mark's past. The prosecution counters this narrative suggesting a deliberate attempt to evade authorities and shield Mark from potential charges related to Victoria's welfare. Mark Gordon's sex offender status continues to be a significant factor in the trial. The prosecution argues that it raises concerns about Victoria's well-being during their time together. Defense lawyers counter that this past conviction is irrelevant to the present charges and risks to unfair prejudice the, prejudice the jury. The Constance Martins case has captured the public's attention from the very beginning of the case. The dramatic disappearance, the tragic discovery of Victoria's remains, and the couple's contrasting narratives have fueled intense media coverage. Social media discussions and news articles continue to dissect the case with a lot of speculation just running everywhere. The ongoing trial is being closely followed by the public eager for answers and the sense of justice for Victoria. The jury were also shown photos of partly destroyed baby clothing and belongings on 31st of January. On 27th of February, the court heard evidence from social services about the sleep dangers that Constance was informed of twice in relation to her newborn baby. Giving evidence in her defense on 7th of March, Constance was asked if she had ever been cruel and she said, that she did nothing but show her love to her daughter, adding that she had given her daughter the best that any mother would. She said she felt intense grief after she woke up to find the baby tucked inside her jacket. Her partner and co-defendant Mark Gordon had earlier changed his mind about giving evidence and he wasn't called by his barrister, John Femai Ola, King's counsel, to defend himself under oath. Giving further evidence on the 8th of March, Constance said that she felt responsible for falling asleep on the baby if that is what happened. She also explained to the court, I had to escape my family as, fam as my family are extremely oppressive and bigoted and they will not allow me to have children with my husband and they would do anything to erase that child from the family line. During the trial, Constance also claimed that a family member prevented her from going abroad by allegedly instilling a travel ban through the High Court. She told jurors that she and Mark, they actually planned to go abroad to raise baby Victoria, but they were unable to do that because of an alleged court order preventing her from traveling abroad. She claimed that this high court case had been behind her back and she was not represented and she didn't receive any advice from a solicitor. She also said that she and her partner, Mark Gordon, were in a state of grief and fear and even though they had considered handing themselves into the police, Constance was worried that she would be blamed for her baby's death. She also pointed out that she was terrified that she would have to stand trial and she didn't want the police to find baby Victoria's remains. However, she said that their baby was their pride and joy and she was shown the maximum amount of love during her short life. Facing questions over whether it was safe to raise a newborn in a tent in winter Constance said that they were looking at it from a Western perspective and cited that children living in igloos and in Mongolia as an example. Constance admitted in court that, that her newborn daughter could have had better after she died. During her cross-examination, she was questioned by the prosecution over the decision to put Victoria's remains in a plastic bag for life bag. Prosecutor Joel Smith asked, is putting her in a bag for life the best that anyone could give her? Constance replied, of course it's not. However, she said, but that's not my child. It's a part of her, but it's not her. I think we are all more than our flesh. We are spirit. Our body is our casing. 
after she passed away of course she could have had better end of quote baby victoria was sitting in her own feces when her body was put in a plastic bag according to constance constance carried on quote i found it too difficult to change her nappy after she passed so i wrapped her in a blanket and pull and put her in the bag I had no intention of keeping her in the bag. I know it looks awful objectively, but neither of us were in the right frame of mind. End of quote. According to her, she feared at the time that people would think of her as an evil woman who has, who has just killed her child once they found out about her daughter's death. She said they weren't in a normal situation and it was a nightmare. Constance repeatedly told the court that babies don't need that much. They need food, they need warmth, they need love. They can cope as long as her, as a parent, can give the baby what she needs. She said you don't need that many items for a newborn baby. The ultimate verdict in the Constance Martin case will likely have a profound impact on the lives of those involved. A guilty verdict could see Constance and Mark face significant prison sentences. Um, an acquittal would raise further questions about Victoria's death and the circumstances surrounding it. And like I said at the beginning of this video, this trial is ongoing. I don't know how long this is going to take, but I'm going to, you know, kind of give you my view so far. I mean, I might change my mind depending on what else comes out during the trial. Now, now get ready because I think that this might be an unpopular opinion. But, okay, is it not a possibility that Victoria's death was just a horrible accident? If we are to believe what uh, Constance is saying, she found her baby in her jacket. So I assume that it's possible Victoria fell asleep on her mother's chest. Her mother covered her with the jacket and, you know, they both fell asleep during night. And at some point, baby Victoria asphyxiated. Yes, don't get me wrong. They do need to be punished for the brutal way that they handled the situation after for how they disposed of baby's body and perverted the course of justice. I agree with that. Maybe that, you know, after they discovered that the baby was sadly deceased, they panicked knowing they are all over the news and the police was looking for them all over the place. So they disposed of the baby's remains where they possibly believed that no one would find her. I don't think that their intention was to get rid of the baby or to kill the baby. And why am I saying that? Because remember, Constance, she gave birth in the car, presumably, right? Because her placenta was found by the car, the burnt car in Bolton. So, you know, she could have very easily left the baby in the car if they really wanted to kill the baby uh, or get rid of her, you know, and just abandon the baby with the car. But they chose to take baby Victoria with them. It would have made it easier for the two of them to run on their own rather than with a baby in tow. Then there is something else which is kind of like very fishy to me. I feel like something more is going on here. Why would you run from such a lifestyle of wealth to go and live in a tent with no comfort, no conditions, nothing? I tend to I tend to believe that they indeed ran away trying to keep at least one baby because they were scared that this baby as well will be taken away. Constance, she lost four children already and although we don't know the full circumstances surrounding the reasons for the children being removed, maybe that Constance, she had a mental breakdown. I mean, as far as we know, there was no abuse of the children. So them being taken away must have affected her somehow. Come on, let's just be, you know, realistic here. They took away four of her children. She tried before with her other child to avoid being identified for who she really was just to keep the baby. So I don't think it's so hard to believe that she could have done the same thing with baby Victoria. She... She didn't want the baby to be taken by social services. Plus, on top of everything, think about her family as well. Think about their connections. Is it so far-fetched to believe that, to believe what Constance is saying, that her family didn't want her to have children with someone like Mark with no money, no upper class or privileged background? Can you really go up against a family like that? And, you know, like I said, I'm not justifying her actions in any way, shape or form, but my opinion is that 
baby Victoria's death was a tragic accident. It's tragic that Constance and Mark didn't think of a better way to deal with the situation. But then again, Victoria would have been taken away from them. But then she wouldn't have lost her life, which is just completely heartbreaking. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for staying with me today. Let me know, please, what do you think about this mad case in the comment section down below. For now, take care, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!